to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down in a place east of the city. There he had made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. Good morning, church. I am so blessed to take us through God's word this morning. And if you have your Bible or your phone with you, we're going to be in Jonah chapter 4. And that's the final chapter in Jonah. I'd encourage you to turn there with me. As I was preparing to teach this final portion of Jonah, I was thinking back to my first experiences with the story of Jonah as a whole. For me, that came in Sunday school in the late 80s. Now, if you went to church as a kid or you had kids in church at that time, you know how we learned our Bible stories. It was not with veggie tales. It was with flannel graphs. The pride of every Sunday school teacher. If you didn't know, these are just some felt background scenes. There's probably four of them for the whole Bible. And you'd have some cut out figures and animals and people and you'd stick on there and you'd illustrate the story. Now, as I remember, there was always that older bossy girl in the class who always knew the best way to set up the story. I'm not bitter, so don't worry about that. (laughs) But the challenge is often that the figures were facing one direction and one direction only. Made things a little difficult. So like, you're doing the Last Supper and Jesus is only giving attention to half of the table. Kind of sad. Speaking of which, The characters weren't even named, they just had little numbers on them. So you might be recreating the feeding of the 5,000, and you're like, you ask your friend, hey, give me Peter, but he actually gives you the character that we all know is John. And so instead you're like, no, give me 127. This 125 man doesn't have a beard, and everyone knows that Peter's got a beard. (laughs) Anyway, I bring that up to say that when it came to Jonah, flannel graphs were great. I mean, you could show Jonah, who looks a lot like the same guy we used for Jesus later on, running away from God. And then you could show him in the boat, and there's a storm, and they throw him overboard. And then, much to the delight of us boys in the class, there's a whale sneaking up from the bottom frame, (laughs) scooping him up, and then spitting him out on the shore. With some other random objects that we found, like a loaf of bread or a golden calf. Wrong story, of course. And then... You could even show him walking through the city of Nineveh and these civilian-looking people that are, are bowing down in repentance. End of story. Good work. Obey God or else, kids. We'll see you next week. But wait, teacher. There's one more chapter. Yeah, but that doesn't work well in the flannel graph world. I mean, we don't have these pathetic, sad, angry guys pouting in the sun. We don't have plants or worms to tell that part of the story. But that is where we are today. Jonah finally did the work he was called to do. Nineveh repented. God graciously relented. Now what? Well, now we get to see where Jonah's heart is at and where his mind is at also and how the God that showed mercy to the entire city of Nineveh still has mercy left for his stubborn, reluctant prophet, Jonah. We're gonna see this unfold verse by verse this morning. 
So again, I'd encourage you to turn there. Whatever translation you have, I'll be in the NIV mostly. So let's go to chapter four, verse one. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Other translations, you might have one say he was exceedingly angry, he was furious, he was really upset. The word for angry here translates to burn. But wait, what exactly is Jonah burning about? We gotta look back at the end of chapter three for that. We talked about that last week. So check out 3.9, the verse right before. Here's how it reads. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. So Jonah is mad, both at the people for turning from their ways, he wished that they didn't, and for God at receiving their heartfelt repentance, he wished that God hadn't. But take notice of his anger, because we're gonna see him on this emotional roller coaster. You might have suspected that through this whole chapter. But I want us to stop there and remember Jonah's original calling, not just at the beginning of this book, but all the way back to his calling as a prophet in the first place. We know that prophets had this extremely difficult task of bringing and changing the word of God and changing the hearts of the people. Emphasis on there. See, God's prophets were primarily intended to communicate and reason with and call out God's people, the nation of Israel. So Jonah was really a missionary prophet. He was called to call out Israel's dreaded enemy, the Ninevites. And most of the prophets we know from scripture, they were unsuccessful at getting their people to change. Their lives and their callings were humbling or frustrating at best. The people either ignored their warnings or tried to harm the prophets. For example, Jeremiah, he tried to warn Israel's king in his day, and his reward was a trip to the bottom of a cistern filled with mud up to his neck, left to starve to death. We don't want to hear it, Jeremiah. And then there's Ezekiel, curiously. He was told to lay on one side of his body on the floor of his house for 390 days, then turn over 40 days for the other side as a sermon illustration to Israel and Judah to represent the number of years they would have to bear punishment if they did not repent. No thanks, Zeke, we will keep our idols. If any of the prophets could get their people to change, don't you think they would be happy? Of course they would. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they could only dream of what we saw happen in Jonah 3. Yet in this story, Jonah's smallest little effort opened the door for the change in the hearts and the ways of an entire city in just three days. Now I'm old enough to remember, I know most of you won't think I'm old, but I'm old enough to remember when we had arcades where one quarter lets you play a game. Good times, right? Now we got these silly slide cards. And my only goal then was to get my initials on the high score screen. For me, it was Pac-Man at the local Pizza Hut. SJC, that is all I wanted to see. So I would empty my pockets and try over and over again to break the top 10. Jonah, as we have learned, he set a new high score for all the prophets in Israel, a score of 120,000 souls to be exact. His initials JSA, Jonah, son of Amittai, they are on every leaderboard in every pizza hut in Nineveh. But is he happy? No, not so much. He's angry and resentful. Now this is really interesting. It's this, this moment in Jonah because we didn't know in the beginning why he didn't want to go in the first place. The reader was left to infer what Jonah's reasoning was. So was he scared of the Assyrian Ninevites, worried he would die if he went there? Did he just feel overwhelmed by their task? Did he pull out his job description and decide that leaving Israel was not something he agreed to? Or did he just not care about what God wanted? All of those could be reasons, and they could play a role in his decision to finally go to Nineveh kicking and screaming and smelling like raw fish. But here is Jonah's reason straight from the source, verses two and three. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. So Jonah 
shares his reason for not going to Nineveh, for stalling and for being angry now, it's wrapped up in what he knows about God's character. He is mad about who God is. Notice that the conversation with God, it starts off with a question. Didn't I tell you? Not off to a good start in your conversation with God. And yet God will let him speak. And he does the same for us. He'll let us pour our hearts out, of him, out to him. He's not afraid or threatened by what we might say. We're free to bring him our hurts and our pains and our frustrations. And I tell our students in youth group this all the time. You can bring God your doubts and your fears and your questions, but you need to be willing to stick around long enough to hear his answer. A lot of people don't. They just dump and run. They refuse to let God separate the truth from the lies of their feelings. I'm reminded of what God said to his servant Job. Different book, different guy. After 30 plus chapters of Job and his friends complaining and accusing and self-defending, God looks right at Job in chapter 38 and he says this, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I love that part. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. So God's gonna tackle Jonah's questioning a little differently, we're gonna see that. Now Jonah, being knowledgeable of scripture, he actually quotes Exodus 34, six in this complaint to God. And um, he says this, and this is what God directly tells Moses about himself when Moses returned to Mount Sinai, you know, for some replacement stone tra- tablets after the actual golden calf incident. And Exodus 34, six, God says this, he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. So Jonah accused God of being merciful and gracious and loving people he shouldn't love, and God was guilty on all counts. What Jonah was not willing to see, though, was the full picture of the God who he was accusing. He forgot all the other passages in the Torah where God claimed the right to show grace to anybody he willed chapter earlier in Exodus 33. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. The ironic truth of all this is that Jonah is still alive because of God's faithful, loving grace in his life. Remember, he got saved from drowning, and he's received the second chance from the same God who he's mad at for giving Nineveh a second chance. And Jonah is so upset that he's ready to die. Studying that brought to mind another prophet, Elijah, who after achieving a great victory over the false prophets of Baal, where God sent fire from heaven and dramatic show of his power, we find Elijah running for his life. He's hiding in the desert. And this is what Elijah says in 1 Kings. And he, Elijah, asked that he might die, saying, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. Both Jonah and Elijah had just been greatly used by God, and yet both wanted to die. Both had allowed resentment to build in their hearts for different reasons. Their peace was destroyed because their purposes, their own man-made purposes, had been diverted. And I think we're in danger of the same error. When we lose sight of what God's doing in us and through us and around us, when the circumstances of life are rising up and it seems like nothing good is ever gonna come, that's when we have to choose to either submit our will and our desires and our plans to God, or we can be angry at the author of our lives because we can't see the story unfolding chapter by chapter exactly the way we would prefer it to. Verse four, but the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? God's response to Jonah also comes in a question. Questions reveal our hearts. There's actually thousands of questions from God in the Bible. Jesus himself asked over 300 questions to his followers. So God enjoys asking questions. And I think this, that we will do well to approach God's word, ready to let it speak to us, ready to see what questions he's asked his people and to what extent he's asking us the same thing. Here's a small sampling of some of the many questions we find throughout scripture. To Adam and Eve, Where are you? Who told you you were naked? To Jacob, 
what is your name? To Isaiah, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then Jesus to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And this particular question for Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? That reveals the Jonah-like heart in everyone reading these words. The Israelites historically loved their blessings from God, but they didn't want to be God's people. They loved the stuff he provided, but they didn't love the provider. They wanted life on their terms. So when God asked Jonah this question, he's asking us similar questions too. Is God just a person that gives you stuff? Is he just a means to an end for you? Is he just a better way to better your life? And are you happy as long as he supports your plans? Jonah did not respond to the question. Did you notice that? Don't worry, though. God's going to continue to pursue his heart through the rest of this conversation. Picking up in verse 5. Jonah had gone out and sat down in a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Wait, 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 hold on. So Jonah gave his message. The people repented. He saw that God relented of the destruction. So what is he doing now? Well, he finds a good viewing spot outside the city to see what's going to happen. Just another piece of evidence that Jonah's heart was not and never was where it should have been. He's apparently still hoping that God's going to come to his senses and see things the way that they are. He still wants to see these heathen enemies destroyed. He's so confident of the possibility that he gets himself, do you notice, as far away from the city as he could, where he could still see. He's probably thinking to himself, oh boy, this is going to be good. There is no way that these people really turn from their sin and evil ways. God's going to have to judge them in some way. No doubt, Jonah mentally retraced his steps and his words as he's sitting there in the sun. Remember chapter 3, his message to Nineveh? It was a short and simple one. Jonah 3, 4, if you can look back there. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. You see, as far as we can tell, he did a great job warning the people of the impending doom, but he spoke nothing apparently of the way out, of a God whose heart was for them, of the hope that could be theirs if they would let go of their sin and embrace God's ways. He didn't say anything about that because he didn't desire any of those things for these wicked people. He did the minimum God asked for and no more. And fortunately, we saw last week that God was still able to accomplish his purposes despite Jonah's ill-intentioned and half-hearted efforts. That reminds me of what Joseph said to his brothers. Another character. Remember Joseph? Colored coat was the last straw thrown into a pit, sold into slavery in Egypt. Only years later, his brothers return during a famine and they find him to be alive, second in Pharaoh's command. And Joseph later on in full forgiveness says this, Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Any harm that Jonah intended in this place was turned around and many, many, many lives were saved. Jonah 4, 6. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort, and Jonah was very happy about the plant. And now we see some more irony. Can you believe this? Jonah goes from very angry, exceedingly angry, to very happy. The only time that you see Jonah happy in the entire book, from Jonah chapter 1 to chapter 4, is when God shades him with sun from the plant. That's the only time. He wasn't happy that God called him, that God cared for him, that God saved him from drowning, that God used him mightily to rescue a nation. He was only happy when there was something serving his own personal need. Talk about a jerk move. Just like Jonah, though, we are in danger of measuring our lives with happiness, with how we feel, with the things we have. And those things become idols so that God's only move 
is to painfully take them away so we can focus our eyes back on him and the joy that we should have in Christ alone. If you remember from Jonah 2, he was trapped in the belly of the fish for three days. Jonah prayed. It was reluctant, but he prayed. And what's interesting is that that prayer that he prayed is almost entirely composed of parts of Psalms. Again, Jonah knew his scripture. No one could knock the prophet for a lack of biblical knowledge. But you see, I was thinking about this, and there's one Psalm in particular that Jonah could have really benefited from calling to mind. I'm thinking of Psalm 51. Some of you know where I'm going with that. It's proved helpful, so helpful to me in the past of getting my relationship back on track with God whenever I've strayed or wandered or created distance. Just three verses from this, but I would encourage you to read the whole thing sometime. He says, David says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. If only Jonah would have begun his trip through Nineveh with that prayer, instead of waiting outside the city to see people die, we might have found him praying for these new believers, tearfully thanking God for his mercy, his great mercy to others, to outsiders, to enemies. But Jonah was so focused on his mission and what he wanted to do and what he thought was right that he fought God all the way. He lost his joy. And maybe there's idols that you need to lay down in your life because they're stealing your joy. Or maybe like Jonah, you've taken God's loving kindness for granted. You started enjoying the gifts, everything he's blessed you with, and forgot the giver. Or maybe you simply lost joy in who God is and what he's done for you through Jesus. As Christians, we need to remember the joy of our salvation is more than just conjuring up those warm, fuzzy feelings surrounding that moment that you first believed. It's good and right to do so, but you have to remember that that's just a moment on your journey with Christ, and the gospel is not a one-and-done message. You have to remind your hearts of the good news of salvation on the daily. I put together this. I think we need to remember these three big things when it comes to our salvation. And these should be sources of great joy. Number one, that we were saved. The theological word for that, justified. Made right with God. Our sins, guilt transferred to Christ. Take joy in the fact that you were saved. Secondly, take joy in the fact that you are being saved. Sanctified. Continually freed from sin's power because of the presence of Jesus in our lives. And then lastly, we can take joy in the fact that we will be saved. The word for that is glorified. The presence of sin one day eliminated when we get to heaven. When we remind ourselves of the gospel and the greatness of our salvation, we are motivated to share it with others. A lackluster desire to share the good news might be evidence of an underappreciation for what God has done for you. So yes, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation and restore to us the joy of your salvation and this church and your church. Restore us to the joy of your salvation. Amen. Verses four and uh, seven and eight. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. So God's crafted this rapid growth and the rapid withering of a plant all as a natural object lesson. And Jonah doesn't give credit to God for the shade, but he's certainly gonna be the first in line to complain about its loss. We know people like that. This is a parallel here. There's Jonah and the Ninevites. Both are in need, right? But Jonah's need for shade is much more trivial. Jonah was threatened by suffering discomfort. Nineveh was threatened by full-on destruction. So God withdraws the shade from Jonah, just like Jonah wished that God had withdrawn forgiveness from Nineveh. 
It's a how do you like it kind of moment. And God's slowly gonna bring Jonah to the full realization of this. Now, while we started out this chapter, Jonah was angry and resentful. But now, he's at the point of anger and bitterness. So we're wise to stop here and do a quick heart check. So here we go. What is a source of bitterness or potential bitterness for you? What has the power to steal your joy, as trivial as it might be, to shift your focus off the things that God wants you to do and say and be? It could be a person who's wronged you in the past or in the present. You might not admit it, but deep down you really despise this person. You've got bitterness. They are your Nineveh. It might be a group of people that you just have a bias against. You might not even hate or despise them. They're just like a threat because they're different. They're unlike you. They're unfamiliar. They're weird. They are your Nineveh. Or you might have a coworker or a neighbor or a classmate that you just don't like. Our Gen Z vocab lesson for the day, you're just not vibing. You avoid them at all costs because they might suck you into a never-ending conversation that you do not care about. You don't have time for that, and I don't want other people to see me with them. They are your Nineveh. As I was preparing this message at home, I could look out the back window and see my garden. I like to pretend that I know how to garden sometimes. Anyone else? Like those three to four weeks when the weather is perfect, it's a lot of fun. But then we know in Arizona that scorching west wind comes in. We know that all too well. We have this tall sunflower that my four-year-old Abraham enthusiastically planted. It was so promising in April, but now it's this dried up brown, very delicate shell of the flower it used to be. I mean, just look at it. One more monsoon and it's gonna go down. I didn't cry over it though, because in a few weeks, I'm gonna crunch it up, and it's gonna become natural mulch for my next attempt at a fall garden. And I think we need to do that with our bitterness. Let God crunch it up and fuel new opportunities for growth. Now, I by no means am a good gardener, but my sister and my sister-in-law, they both are. They live in Arkansas and Oklahoma, respectively, So they kind of have an unfair advantage there already of this thing called regular rainfall and cool weather. So here, in fact, is a photo from my sister's current garden. (laughs) So much better than mine. And I'm reminded of this fun term that they use for plants that grow up in the garden that they never actually planted. You know, it's like the seeds are dormant in the soil, maybe from an old tomato or a flower or a weed from last season, and with a little water and some weather change, that seed will sprout. And it might not be where you wanted it, and it might not even be what you wanted to grow there. And they call such plants volunteers. That's the official name. That sunflower I showed you in her garden is one such plant. It doesn't belong, it just grew. And these volunteers come from seeds that were not forced or expected to do anything. They just showed up. They took root and they began anew just because they could, because they were given the opportunity to grow. And some of us will do well to consider that in terms with our enemies or people we tolerate or we just don't understand. Where do the roots of bitterness need to give way to a new harvest of peace? I think we need to realize that God lovingly puts us in places where we're pressed so that our desires conform to his plan for our life. Just like Nineveh needed to repent of their sin and Jonah needed to repent of his rebellion, pushing against God's plans and purposes, we might need to repent for our lack of desire to see compassion shown to other people, replacing our natural human apathy with Christ-like empathy. Let's keep going in our passage. God's ready to retry his question from verse four because now Jonah's lost something that he deeply valued. Verse nine, but God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. So Jonah is essentially crying over a plant. 
I would hate for him to see my garden. There would be a lot of tears there. (laughs) Yet he failed to mourn the potential loss of an entire population of a huge city. He was willing to refuse compassion and leave them to their fate in eternity separated from their creator in hell. So it made me think, when did you and I last shed tears for those who don't know Jesus? Or to take it a step further, how about shedding tears over the eternal fate of those who oppose or would hurt you but still don't know Jesus? Unlike Jonah weeping because God took away comfort, we should be a people that weep for those who do not yet know the comfort and hope and peace and joy that's found in Jesus alone. Speaking of Jesus, he actually demonstrated the proper attitude towards the lost. As he and his disciples made their way into Jerusalem, his final stop before his crucifixion, we read this in Luke 19, 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Why? He was mourning the loss of a people who would soon kill and reject him, who were about to miss the Messiah himself right in front of them. A few verses later, he says, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. At another point in the Gospels, Matthew records, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We're surrounded by people who do not, have not, maybe even will not recognize Jesus as God's gift to us. They're lost, they're helpless, harassed, but we're still called to pray for and speak the truth in love to a lost and hurting world. A world that either by choice or ignorance or confusion will also miss the Messiah. Okay, I've got some good news for us. Jonah is now done talking, finally. (laughs) And God will get the final word in as he should Here's how we finish this object lesson to hopefully get Jonah back in line. Verses 10 and 11. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? God points out to Jonah that he cared about plants. God does too. God also cares for animals. He saw the animals in Nineveh that they made to repent and fast as well, and he even lists them as a reason right there for his compassion. But news alert, God cares way more about people. People who he created in his own image. People who don't know their right hand from their left hand, spiritually speaking. And I think we sometimes go about our lives thinking that every person we pass on a walk or in the store, on the street, at least here in America, they already know Jesus. They already know who he is and they either accepted or rejected him. After all, 68% of Americans still identify as Christian according to a survey done this year. But I'm afraid that in taking a small sample size of the community we live in, it would reveal that very few have actually been exposed to the true gospel and the hope that it brings, the truth that salvation is found by grace through faith in Christ alone. You see, the Christianity that they might be exposed to falls on this spectrum between hateful people standing on the side of a road with Jonah-like signs that say, turn or burn and God hates you, all the way to a Christianity that says, we're good people. You can do whatever you want. Heaven's open to all. Just be kind to others and do your very best. But we who claim biblical Christianity, we can't forget what Jesus said in John 14, 6, that he is indeed the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. He's not one way or a way. He is the way, the only way. And every other path leads to destruction Wait, I'm sure a few people could get into heaven if they, no one comes to the Father except through him. One of my favorite things about this book is the way it ends right here. It's so surprisingly, yet perfectly abrupt. God claims full sovereignty, and Jonah doesn't respond. 
Now, we don't know if he did and it just wasn't recorded, but we can hope that if he did, it sounded something like Job's humble reply after he himself was corrected by God. Job said this, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. I think the amazing reminder from Jonah chapter four is that God pursues us as individuals still, just like he did Jonah. We can see that in addition to God caring about all the lost people that are all around you and all of your spheres of influence, he still leans in and he whispers to you, how is your heart? That was a big takeaway for me as I studied and prepared for this morning. I'm just over two years in as a math teacher called to youth ministry. And I've seen God do amazing things in our church and in our youth group and in our community. And I know that by the power of Jesus, greater things are still to come. And I love what I get to do every day to serve the kingdom of God and you and your families but through this study, I've come to realize that I can too easily give all my attention and energy and time into ministry, and I can neglect my own heart. And I can too easily find myself in God's word for hours at a time because I've got to find truth to bring to our students. But then I miss the truth that God wants to speak to me. And I can too easily be in prayer before the Lord and bring praises and requests of other people with deep concern and then not lay down my own burdens before the throne of grace. So one thought, one question hit me especially hard recently. God was saying this, God might be working through you, but are you letting him work in you? See, God ultimately cared more about Jonah's heart than the work that he did. He cares more about our hearts than any ministry or work or calling that he places on us, and we can take comfort in that. And you might already be fighting that Jonah heart really hard, and you're deeply concerned about other people in your life, that they would come to know Jesus, so you pray and you show and you speak, but don't lose sight of your love for the one that you want them to desperately love. To close, I want us to go back to the ideal idea of flannel graphs that we opened with. See, as a kid, I now realize that I wrongly used to see the Bible as a bunch of isolated stories. Maybe flannel graphs contributed to that, I don't know. Noah and the ark, David and Goliath, Jonah and the whale, Jesus and the cross, amazing, powerful stories, but I unintentionally saw Jesus as just another one of the great heroes in the Bible, just one of the guys. And I failed to hear the whispers of Jesus and his salvation in every story throughout the Bible. Sometimes the character exhibits in part what Jesus is then gonna come and demonstrate in perfect fullness. Other times the character represents a total 180 degree contrast to the coming Messiah. That's the case in Jonah. You see, unlike Jonah, Jesus didn't run from his calling. He ran to it, and he runs to you. Jonah had to be thrown in the ocean to calm its waves. Jesus just had to give a simple command, peace, be still, and he says that to you. And Jesus didn't spend three days in a fish Rather, he spent three days in the darkness of a tomb, and then he rolled the stone away. And unlike Jonah, who sat outside the city, waiting to see all the people destroyed, Jesus willingly let himself be destroyed outside the city so that all the people could be saved, that whoever believes should not perish, but have eternal life. I'm so grateful that God pursues our Jonah-like hearts and that when Jesus looks at your enemies, he sees people worth dying for so that when you look at your enemies, you can see people worth sharing the hope that you live for. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the power 
of your word. May we be encouraged and convicted by the truth that we encounter today. Jonah feels like it ends unresolved, and maybe just like Jonah, we are now called to choose our response to your compassion for others. Let us leave this place with a renewed desire to see your mercy and grace shown to others in the name of, in the name of Jesus magnified. Just like Jonah's resentful and bitter heart was worth pursuing, we're reminded that you still pursue us as individuals in the mi- middle of our mess. That even while we were still dead in our sin, Jesus bore our sin in his body on the cross. Lord, restore to us the joy of your salvation and let it be fuel for us as we obey your command to spread the gospel. It's in your name we pray, amen.